current city. Hopefully that'll last me for the next 60 minutes. I'm glad you're here tonight. I'm excited. This is going to be a special time of worship and fellowship. Uh, let me just report in to you about what my family and friends said about the church. It was all positive. I mean, they raved about you. They went on and on and on. They loved the piano. They loved the music. They loved the fellowship. They loved the food. Not a word said about the sermon. <laughs> uh, but they really, really had a good time. And, 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 and even our friends from Tupelo said, oh, I wish I lived closer so I could be part of a close church like this. And, and just nothing like a smaller church. We're family. And they said as soon as we walked in, we knew we were at a special, special place. So I'm just swelling with pride tonight. I'm not bragging. I'm just reporting the truth to you. <laughs> but thank you for reaching out and being so sweet to them. I knew you would be. Just continue to pray for uh, Brother Dwight to uh, order. He is better. In fact, his, his uh, symptoms are not that bad. He just has to stay in doctor's orders. Uh, some of you may know, uh, his name just left me, uh, Mike Dew's sister, uh, sister's husband, Don Emerson. Do y'all know Don Emerson? Had a pretty major heart attack this week. Is it Emerson? Yeah. I think okay. his husband's name is Mike. Mike Emerson. No, it's it's Mike's sister's husband. Oh, Don lives in Brownsville. Anyway, had a pretty major heart attack this morning. <coughs> and they care flying into uh, the hospital room. He's got some blockages, but they were able to put some stents in, so he's okay. And then why to have cousin Mark Wynn, who died during the service this morning, they were notified, 49 years old. So you be in prayer for him, Mark Webb. And of course, we got several others who are sick and, and just in need of our prayers. So you lift those people up. Do you have any additional names you'd like to share? Additional concerns? Well, I have another great grandchild who broke his foot oh, last no. Wednesday. Oh, no. The he had a cast from his hip down. And so. Oh, no. That's a bad one. Yeah. Oh. It is. How old is he? 11. Bless his heart. Oh. So he's going to be pretty uh, incapacitated for a while then. Uh, oh, no. How did he break it? I'm going to have to be no football. Football. Oh, no. <laughs> that ended Jordan's football career pretty quickly. He broke his collarbone, and that ended it. It ended that as quick as it started. Uh, <laughs> bless his heart. What about answered prayers? Anybody have an answered prayer? God done anything good for you? Oh, Amen. I was glad to hear that. Glad Miss Lottie is here. And uh, glad Miss Patsy's back. She had a good time at the beach. Uh, glad she's back. Glad to have the Whittington's daughter and son-in-law here. Hey, I, you got man fun. Oh, well, you're so young looking. I thought that was your daughter and son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so young. Uh, well, you look young. That looks like Steve's sister. I tell you. So, Oh. That is decent. Hey, okay, okay. Well, I, okay. So the fella you're with is your son. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Because I knew that was you, Sharon. I, I, I thought you were pulling my leg, Mr. Horace. I knew that was Sharon. Well, that's Sharon's son. Okay. Well, I was half right. Oh, yeah, half right. Any other blessings that you'd like to share? All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We're thankful for this church and the way the church ministered to my friends and family today. And uh, Lord, I believe it was a great day in your house. I appreciate Riley so much. I appreciate Steve's flexibility and stand, stepping in and leading us. I'm uh, grateful to be part of such a wonderful family, a, a generous family, and a, and a caring and considerate family. 
It is a great privilege, Father, to be part of this fellowship. And, and uh, apparently this is my first uh, anniversary. <laughs> I don't keep up with things like that, but apparently that's the case. And this has been a wonderful year, and I anticipate many, many more to come. I'm thankful to be working with Mr. Horace. I pray you bless him and just give him the strength and the uh, encouragement that he needs in order to carry out his ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sharon, you just get younger every day. He thought you was amen. <laughs> so good to see you.
inherited this from Dwight. <laughs> Dwight picked these out. And I appreciate Steve taking the ball and running with it. That one that uh, we struggled with this morning is yeah. not a real familiar one either. Uh, Y'all did a real good job yeah, on it. Kind of, job. kind of nice to reintroduce some of the oldies, but goodies, isn't it? I want you to take your Bible, turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, beginning to read in verse 1. The New Testament book of Acts, chapter 6, beginning to read in verse 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, that's the apostles, called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea. So they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, <coughs> Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were con converted also. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am personally grateful for the hundreds of demons <coughs> along whom I have served. They have been a blessing. They have rescued me. They have saved me from my own self on more than one occasion. They've given me good advice. Lord, as I look back, I can't think of a single time in my ministry when the deacons had given me bad advice. They truly uh, represent that verse that says, in a multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. And I'm grateful for the men with whom I serve here at Papa Corner. I'm grateful for some who are long-term deacons, and others who are rookies like Brother Horace. And Father, he's living proof that even at 87 years old, that is not too old to step out on adventure with you. And I pray that you use him in a great way. I'm thankful that he has a godly family who stand by him and encourage him. And I pray that we would be diligent about lifting him up, him up and interceding on his behalf in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When I got to college and took freshman English 101, I learned a new word. I had never heard this word before. <laughs> Teacher got up there and, and said, well, how many of y'all have heard of so-and-so? That was a new one on me. I'm a graduate of the Memphis City School, so perhaps there were a lot of, not a lot of words that I should have learned. But I learned this word, and I want to introduce it to you if you are not familiar with it. It is the word oxymoron. Y'all know what an oxymoron is? That is two opposite words that are used together in a phrase. And there are several examples that people have cited. Military intelligence. <laughs> that is an oxymoron, <laughs> is it not? Tight slacks. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. Slacks means they're supposed to be loose. How can you have tight slacks? Jumbo shrimp. Have you thought about that? <laughs> shrimp, that big. How can it be jumbo? I don't care if it's that big or that big, it's still small. It's an oxymoron, jumbo shrimp. Now, here's the ultimate, Laura. I think this is the ultimate oxymoron, fun run. 
You ever heard that? Oh, come on, come on. We got a one mile fun run. There is nothing fun about running, is it? You ever see me running? Please kill what it is that's chasing me. But all of those are examples of oxymorons. Well, there is an oxymoron in this passage. Two words that should never, ever be used together. Various translations translate it different ways. The New King James translates it multiplying and complaining. Other translations say expansion and dissension. Increasing and complaining. My translation, the New Living, says uh, multiplied and rumblings. Now those are words that ought not ever be used together. I guess the best translation that I've run across is growth and grumbling. The church was growing and people grumbled. Those are two words that ought never be used together. When we grow, there ought to be a spirit of unity. When we grumble, that is a hindrance to the work of the local church. So the church had a minor problem that could have become a major problem. Keep in mind, this is a church that was only a, a few months old. Maybe not even that much. Maybe a few weeks old. It just popped up overnight. How would you like to say, well, I'm going to start a new church in Haywood County on the courthouse next Sunday morning and 3,000 people show up? You wouldn't really be prepared for that, especially 3,000 people of all sorts of backgrounds. So it was brand new, and there were three major issues that affected the church. I guess one issue is that these believers who had just recently come to faith were greatly outnumbered, probably a thousand to one. This was a small, they were considered to be a fringe sect, a kind of a cult, and they were greatly outnumbered by society. Uh, another big issue was some doctrinal differences. Now, we don't have to agree at every single point on doctrine and theology, but there are some basics on which we ought to agree. You ought to agree this is the Word of God. You ought to agree that Jesus is the Messiah. You ought to agree that He's the only means of salvation, that He's coming back. You know, we allow ourselves some wiggle room, but there was a big problem in the church created by some people who called themselves Judaizers. They believed that you could not go from being a Gentile to a believer. You had to go from being a Gentile to a Jew, and then you could become a believer. That Judaism is the, the on-ramp that leads you onto the highway that leads to heaven. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to follow the Jewish law. You've got to follow the traditions. You just can't go from being a Gentile to a believer. There's an intermediate step. And these Judaizers just caused, caused problem after problem. And at least three books of the New Testament are written against this problem. Another issue was that these early church members were criminals. They were in violation of the Roman law. How, again, how would you like to say, well, we've started a church of 3,000, and every one of them is a wanted man, a wanted woman, according to the law. The police are just circling us, surrounding us, because we are all criminals. Every one of these believers was a criminal, <laughs> because the law required them to bow the knee to Caesar. He was the god of the Roman Empire, and they were required to bow down and say, Caesar is Lord. These people refuse to do that. <laughs> so how would you like to be part of a church like that? Outnumbered, they were operating in an illegal group. They just couldn't quite get together on their theology. So you had some problems that threatened the early church in its very 
infancy, it could have died before it ever had a chance to really sprout and grow and thrive. Now let me share a little two-point outline with you. I think the outline this morning was nine points, so I'm going to give you a couple of points back tonight. Just a very, very simple two-point outline. Number one, the cause of the problem in the church. What was it that caused this issue? Well, according to verse 1, there were some Greeks, some, some, some uh, non-Jewish widows who felt like they were being neglected. They felt like they were not being given the attention that they deserved. Now, in the church, there were two subgroups. The Hebrews were the ones who had been worshiping God for generations and generations. They traced their roots all the way back to Abraham. They'd been circumcised. They followed the law. They practiced the, the traditions and the festivals and, and the feast of Judaism. However, they were a little less educated, a little less sophisticated, more apt to be uh, working stiffs. They did not uh, add a lot of polish and reputation to the church. They sort of looked with disdain on the other group. The other group was, were the Greeks. Now, the Greeks were well-educated. They were sophisticated. They had good white-collar jobs. They gave a lot of money to the church. But these simple Hebrew Jews thought these Greeks were Johnny-come-latelys. Well, they just show up. They had to climb the ranks. They can't count their history back to Abraham. So both sides viewed each other with disdain. You got both groups who love Jesus. They had been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, but they had vastly different backgrounds and expectations and approaches to ministry. So it's not surprising that problems arose. You think our church is diverse. We're really not. There are a lot of uh, homogeneity to our church. That means we all uh, are, are very similar. But in those days, there was a great variety of background to the church. The early church had a strong practice of ministering to widows and orphans. You know, James, in the book that bears his name, says real religion is this, that you look after widows and orphans in their time of need. That is the best way that you demonstrate your religion is real. So they took that seriously. They took care of widows in the church, and, and they needed to. If you were a widow in that day, you couldn't own property. You couldn't get a job. The only thing you could do was get remarried or become a prostitute. So these widows really needed help from the church. And each widow got 14 meals a week, two meals a day. Now, the Greek widows felt like they were being neglected, felt like they were being overlooked. It may or may not have been the case. We really don't know. It may have just been perception on their part, but there arose this difference because of a perceived slight in the congregation. You know, 99 percent of all of our church squabbles start over something like that. They start over something relatively minor. Uh, you know, churches don't split over huge issues. They split over minor things that become major. They just fester and grow and grow. And, and like I said, it may have been a perception problem. You know, we've had problems, I've had problems with people over perception. It just talks about various understandings and interpretations. So you had some widows whose feelings were hurt. And I have learned over the years that the worst people's feelings to hurt 
are widows in your church. You want them on your side. You want them to know they are loved and needed and appreciated. These women were probably homebound, and they just felt forgotten and neglected, and, and uh, it got back to the apostles. Now, according to verse 2, the apostles said, we really don't need to be involved in this. We have other things to do. Others ought to take care of feeding these widows. And then look at verse 4. I want to just constantly call your attention to this. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. That, those were the two most important jobs the apostles did. And let me just tell you, those are my two most important jobs. Prayer and study of the Word. Now, I'm going to try my best to be a good pastor and to visit. I, you know, I'm following a man who is the best <coughs> at visiting and being a pastor. And I'm never going to be another brother, brother Eddie, but I, I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good leader. I want to try to be a good administrator and keep things sort of organized. But, but you know, my two biggest functions are praying for you and praying for needs. And listen, we don't put these names on here just to take up space. Jane works very hard on this list. And I want you to know I pray for every name on this list every week, and you all too as well. Keep it someplace nearby. Keep it by, by your Kindle. Keep it by your iPad. Something that you're going to see every day. I also want you to know, and I don't do this to polish my halo, but I just want you to know that once a week at least, I get our church roll, about five pages, and I pray by name for every name on that roll. That's where God really led me to start this in-reach focus. There are names on there who have not darkened our doors in a good long while. And I thought, you know, we've been praying for these folks. Let's put some feet to those prayers and reach out and let them know that they are missed. So, so it's important that I pray, and it is important that I study and make sure I am ready to preach on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I, I want you to know these sermons don't just flow from Zeus's breath. I don't just open my mouth and the words come. It's a lot of work. I'm not a, really a naturally very intelligent guy. It's a lot of work. And, and I don't mind. I really enjoy it. It's something that brings me a lot of satisfaction just to read and read and read and study and put something together and, and you know, just leave the results up to God. But that's the two most important things I do. And I hope that you'll not to feel badly toward me if you come by and I'm back in my man cave study, or I'm back in my man cave praying. I've got a man cave, by the way. <laughs> I don't have enough room in my office, so I've kind of confiscated another room for my escape place. But if I'm back there studying, don't, don't feel sore to me. Just say, well, that's what he ought to be doing. I think that is the highest calling for a, a minister. I, I just know a lot of preachers who do not study. Uh, they just don't. The, I had a pastor one time. He'd just get on the internet and download and, and you know, borrow or plagiarize a sermon 10 minutes beforehand and get up there and, and read it. And when he got up there to preach, I'd take my iPad. I knew the source from which he plagiarized, and I'd just find it, and I'd just read along alongside. You know, that's theft. That's deception. I'm just not going to do that. And if I do it, I'll readily admit it to you because I don't want you checking back up on me and finding out that, you know, I, I'm not a man of, of integrity. So the, the uh, apostle said, we really don't need to get involved in this. We have other things to do. Uh, we're not denigrating this problem. We're not acknowledging that, it, that it's not a problem. We're just saying there are other people who can take care of this. So that's the cause of the problem. There were people who felt overlooked. Point number two, the cure for the problem. What did they do? Well, verse two, I love what they did. 
So the twelve called a meeting. And it was congregational church government. Got everybody together. The apostles didn't just, you know, lay down the law. The bishop didn't lay down the law. The people all came together and discussed it in a rational, reasonable manner. Now, I know people have laughed about Baptist business meetings for 2,000 years. And, and let me tell you, I've been in some home dinners. But I've been in some, in fact, most of them I've been in have been very positive. Because there's just, it, it's a good idea to just bounce it off people and get their responses. And if you don't like it, speak up. Man, I'd rather you speak up now than out in the parking lot after the meeting. Or down at Jack's over coffee the next morning. Just speak up. And let's just discuss it like believers. Discuss it like adults. That's what they did. They just laid out the problem. And a solution was suggested. And I believe this is the creation of the office of deacon. Even though the word deacon is not used. The idea is found throughout the entire passage. Uh, actually, I guess the origination of the, the office goes all the way back to Moses. Moses was, was trying to lead the people. It got to where he just couldn't do it. <laughs> Could you lead three million people by yourself without any help at all? So he got some help, and things went well because he just distributed some of the responsibility to other people. But here you've got recognition given to seven men in the office of deacon is created. <laughs> the word deacon, diakonos, is a, an old, old, old Greek word. It literally means eater of the dust. Eater of the dust. It refers to people who travel behind the army, cleaning up the mess they had made. Deacons, you've had to do a lot of that with me, have you? <laughs> Over the years, I've had deacons who've had to follow behind me and clean up my mess. Sort of the, I guess it's kind of the, the ancient equivalent of the fellows with shovels who follow after the circus parade. Clean up the mess. That's really the meaning of the word deacon. You do everything you can to Make sure that things are running smoothly. So the apostles in essence are saying, we just can't do this on our own. Let's get some men to help. So they've got seven men. They're described, number one, as, as in good standing. They've got a good reputation. Listen, Brother Morris has a good reputation. People know him. People love him. People appreciate the work that he did and, and all the people he supervised. He was the boss over a lot of people right out of school, and he was patient with them, and he's just a highly thought of man, filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, that means the Holy Spirit is at in, is in work in your life. You know, Paul says when the Spirit of God is at work, it'll be evidenced by some fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And then it says these men were filled with wisdom. It goes back to what I said this morning. The, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. You know, my, my mother's dad had about a third grade education, but he was the smartest man I've ever known in my life. He could do anything. And listen, I don't care where we were. We had to be home at 6.27 p.m. Because that's when the stocks rolled across the bottom of the TV screen. And this man with a third grade education knew more about stocks than, than most financial planners I know. And he was a, a, a wise man, and I just thought so much of it. So wisdom, I'd say it doesn't necessarily mean degrees. You may or may not have a, a degree. It simply means that you know God, you know who he is, what he's capable of doing. So they chose these men, all Greeks, by the way. Better to have Greeks taking care of Greeks. So they got these seven uh, men, and they laid hands on them. The very first ordination ceremony. 
What does it mean to lay hands on people? You know, the Roman Catholic Church says that it, it conveys authority. They say, you know, Peter laid hands on somebody, he laid hands on somebody, he laid hands on somebody, and it goes back 2,000 years, that, that it is just the conveyance of authority. Now, in reality, it didn't, didn't have anything to do with authority. The only authority in our church is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not vested in any human. When we lay, lay hands on you, Mr. Horace, and others of you who have been ordained, we are simply saying we have investigated this man. We believe this man is worthy of the honor of deacon, and it is an honor. Because people have looked at you, examined you, and voted for you overwhelmingly. It is an honor. It's not something that we have to twist your arm to do. We ought not have to do that. We're simply saying, I believe this man or these men is worthy to serve the Lord Jesus Christ here in this church. When I was ordained, I, I don't know, I guess I thought when I stood up, after that ordination service, that I would feel different, that I'd have some sort of magical powers. I, I didn't feel any different, but I just felt overwhelmed by the endorsement of those men at First Baptist Church, Bolivar, Tennessee. Most of them have gone on to be with the Lord. But I had them sign the back of the certificate, and we're going to do that for you, Mr. Horace. And, and I look back, and there's my dad's name on there, my grandfather who's dead, my uncles who are dead, some cousins who are dead, some deacons whom I greatly admire, most of whom uh, are dead, my pastor uh, who's now dead. But you know, the Bible says they being dead still speak. And every time I look at those names, I remember that service. And what was the result? This is the last point I want just to call to your attention. What was the result of those deacons? They, that resolution of that problem, what happened as a result? Verse 7, God's message continued to spread. Number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted also. So you had more disciples who came along as a result of that ingenious plan led by the Holy Spirit. You even had some Jewish priests who came to faith in Christ. These were people who spent their entire lives looking for Messiah. They decided Jesus was not he, so they kept looking. But they came to faith in Jesus Christ because they saw a harmonious, unified church moving out as a family and an army. Listen, these are the dream churches. This is what every church ought to be. Number one, led by the Spirit. Spirit of God leads us and guides us in everything we do. Number two, equipped by the pastor. Yeah, I help you, I equip you for spiritual warfare. Number three, administered by committees. Uh, I don't have to make all the decisions. We've got people who know business a lot better than I do. Who know decorating a lot better than I do. Can I get an amen back there? <laughs> who know the bus better than I do. You know, they administer things. It's not necessary for me to go to the bus committee meeting and try to decide whether we want 10W40 or 5W40. And I just trust people to do that. Also, I believe the best churches are governed by the congregation. We make our decisions. If we want to buy an F-15 in our next business meeting, nobody can tell us no. That's probably pretty inadvisable. <laughs> Nobody can tell us no. We make our own rules guided by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, I think ideal churches are served by the deacons. They help shoulder the load that has fallen upon them. So, Mr. Cars, I believe God has brought you to this point. He led you to Brownsville, led you to Poplar Corner, and he's led you to this point, and I'm so excited about serving with you. <coughs> now, let me tell you what's going to happen. Brother Bobby Pratt is our chairman of deacons for the, uh, the year coming up. He's going to come and read scripture. He's going to read the qualifications for deacon. And Mr. Harris, I believe you, you measure up and then some. He's then going to lead us in prayer, and then I will step us through the laying on of hands. And then when that's complete, we have a gift we want to share with you. 
and then we'll all come by and congratulate you and Miss Jesse and Mr. Smith. So Bobby, you come on as the service continues. <coughs> Chairman and Deacon, I don't know about this F-15 airplane that he's talking about, but I think I told you I, some, of the men, some of the men may decide that we want to go a different route. Well, I told you, I don't advise it. If y'all want to do it, I'm gay. I know some of y'all in the back probably cannot see it. Uh, the wording on this coordination service sign up here, where it's the bottom, the bottom line down at the bottom where it says, for those who have answered the call, and that is a, a call that we have had uh, from the members of our church to be a deacon. And I know I'm not worthy to be a deacon, but I try to do the best I can with the leadership that we have with, other, with the pastor and the other deacons here. We are able to try to... Uh, all stay in agreement, and and uh, we seem like we've done an adequate job of that in the in the past, and I pray that we will continue to do that also. Uh, the wording I'm going to be reading tonight is uh, Richard gave this to me and asked me to read it. It's First uh, Timothy three eight through thirteen, and I'm. Um, not reading from the King James, so if you're looking at that, you may have a little different interpretation there or wording. It says, Deacons, <clears throat> likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. And the wives, too, must be worthy of respect and slanderers, self-control, faithful in everything. <coughs> deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own household compatibly. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And I don't know that any of us can hardly measure up to everything here, but I'm going to make a comment about wives. Most of us have super good, super good wives here that stand beside us that help us in this. To keep us from straying when we are, might want to or get on the wrong thought or something like this. And Amen. why it's a very, very important part of a deacon. And uh, I would like to just say thank you for all you ladies that stand beside us. And at this time, I'm going to say a couple words about Mr. Horace. I don't think we could, uh, could come up with anybody much more suitable for this position than Mr. Horace. And I know Miss Jessie would be there with you and support you in everything that you do. And I think you will be a, a, a plus for us uh, when we try to make decisions that, uh, that are good for the church. And uh, I pray that it will stay that way, that we uh, will we'll try to make the decisions that we need to make. And, uh, and uh, I know you'll, you'll be a, a great, great part of that. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be a deacon. I pray that you will support me in everything that I try to do that would be according to your will, dear Lord. And if it's not, that you will step on my toes and let me know that we're going the wrong way, dear Lord. We just pray for each of the deacons here in this church, what they mean to me as a personal friend, support, and the opportunity that I have to be chairman of the deacons, I feel so unworthy, but the men have supported me and elected me to do the job. And I pray to the Lord that I will do the best that I can possibly do with your help. 
And I pray for this church that it will continue to go forward as long as we stay in the motion that we need to be for your leadership, dear Lord. Help us to have more wisdom. And give us knowledge, dear Lord, also. And pray that we will always strive to do the very, very best that we possibly can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Jesse, I'm going to ask you to come and take your place in the seat here. Mr. Jim Horace. <laughs> Mr. Horace, we're not ordaining you, Miss Jesse. We want you to sit on the front pew. Uh, we want you to sit on the front pew, Miss Jesse. And Mr. Horace, you come sit in the chair. I got that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> You sit right here, Miss Jesse. Mr. Hart, you sit right here. And I'm going to ask all of the or you sit right here. Uh, ask all of the ordained men to come and lie.